Lord Jesus, we have um, been in your word and in the prophecy of Amos for some time now. And we see that we are a people who deserves your judgment. And we belong in a nation, in a society that deserves your judgment. And we know that you sent your son in order to uh, stand in our place, in order to be our substitute. Father, we pray that that realization of what great expense you have gone to to save us, that it would convict our hearts that we would be drawn uh, into a closer reconciliation with you. That this morning when we leave, we would leave a people who has been healed. That we would be a people who are transformed into the likeness of Jesus. We pray this by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On April 29th, in 1957, a little baby boy was born. His name was Timothy. Timothy was a normal boy. He grew up in New York State and uh, had a mom and dad and uh, lived a quite normal, well-adjusted life until he left to go to college. Now, it was the 1980s, and uh, Timothy was searching for his identity and uh, got into partying, got into alcohol, and uh, it led him um, into an addiction to heroin. And Timothy had uh, an event happen to him where he overdosed on heroin, and he barely survived. And coming out of that, he had to have something in his life, some cause that he was dedicated to. And so in 1990, he headed up to Alaska. And he went to the Katmai National Park, and he saw the wild grizzly bear, and he fell in love. And he would camp out every summer, and he would um, introduce himself to these bears, and he would get to know them. He gave them names. As all of the bears would come um, into the area of like Bristol Bay and up in there where there's lots and lots of uh, salmon runs, uh, the bears would come to gorge themselves on salmon, and Timothy would find himself in the long bear grass making friends with the grizzly bears. He took virtually no precautions. He had no bear spray on him. When he would go to sleep at night in his tent, he had not even electric wires around his tent. He had become, through the course of time, more and more familiar with the grizzly. And as he got more and more familiar with the grizzly, he felt safer and safer. Uh, in the beginning of the turn of the century, in the 2000 era, he started to get national attention. He wrote a book about his experiences. He started an organization um, to help protect grizzly bears. He had speaking engagements. He had a book deal, and he found himself on late-night TV describing to folks like David Letterman what he was doing in Alaska. Finally, in the year 2003, Timothy Treadwell had an event happen to him. And he had brought along his girlfriend. She was along with him that summer shooting film, and there uh, they were setting up a shot, um, and they had the lens cap still on the camera. 
And there is six minutes of footage, uh, no video but audio, of Timothy being mauled to death by a hungry grizzly bear. His time with the grizzly bears was punctuated by a nasty, forgive the pun, grizzly death for he and his girlfriend. It cost him his life. And in the end, I suppose everybody sort of said, well, they're wild grizzly bears. Why? How? Could someone go to bear country? A piece of clothed meat hanging out next to hungry grizzly bears and think that nothing was going to happen. How could Timothy go so far astray? How could he actually mentally get to the place where he and his girlfriend would camp out where all of the hungry grizzly bears were eating? In fact, most people are simply sur surprised that it took so long for him to get mauled to death. I think there is a lesson to be learned from Timothy. And that is having a relationship with a grizzly bear is not the same as having a healthy relationship with a grizzly bear. And I think that we do this very often with God. I think that we fail to remember exactly who he is, that he's not tame, that he is not at our beck and call, and though he loves us, he is the living God. The book of Amos is really about one thing. If you want to boil the entire book of Amos down, which I'm about to do, it's really about this. The people of God had gotten so comfortable with the one true living God. They had gotten so familiar with the one true living God that the prophet Amos could not shock them out of their dull hearing. He could not shake them out of their stupor. They had been to the temple and step by step, they had slowly but surely twisted their theology from having them being a people chosen by God in orbit around Him in His grand plan, part of His purpose, one of His people, and their theology slowly but surely was twisted and perverted until they were at the center and God was one of the things orbiting around them. I bring you a word of challenge this morning, but for those who will listen, it is good, good news. A relationship with God is not a healthy relationship with God. Just because you have a relationship with God does not mean you have a healthy relationship with God. If you are a person who constantly goes back and says, I'm okay, everything's okay, I have a relationship with God, I want to ask you a question. Is it a healthy relationship with God? Is God in the right place and are you in the right place? Lest you find yourself like Timothy Treadwell, mauled to death by a grizzly bear simply because he failed to recognize some very apparent truths about this animal. It's wild, it's hungry and you are meat. It's crazy that somebody could take those facts and start to dilute them with other facts, with other perceptions, until they get to the place where they feel the grizzly bear is no danger to them. And I want to give you an opportunity to think about the way in which you relate to God 
so that you don't get mauled to death. It is that serious. It is that serious. And so without any further introduction, let's dive in to the very last chapter of Amos. Amos, who is begging the people of Israel to realize that they have a relationship with the one true living God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega. He answers to no one. And they were his special people. But somehow they had allowed their theology to put God in their hip pocket. He was for them. He was about them. They were the center of the story. They were the center of attention. And God's job was to ensure that their every need was met. And so they had become an actual evil people. They knew they were evil. All of the nations around Israel knew that they were evil. When the nations around Israel said, tell us about your God, and they would tell them about Yahweh, they would say, you guys are nothing like that. And the Israelites knew it, but the Israelites, rather than changing, would point to their theology and say, we're safe. We are safe from God because we are his special people. We are safe from God because he drew us up out of the land of Egypt. We have a salvation story. We are safe from God because we have a temple in which he resides. We are safe from God because, 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 because. But the truth is, nobody ever is safe from God. God loves us. He has a plan for us. But we must not place ourselves in his shoes. Hear this vision, starting in Amos chapter 9 and verse 1. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said... Just want to pause here, because remember, uh, Amos is in a church. It's probably not too unlike this church. Okay? He's going into a church, right? and, um, and it's in this uh, place um, called Bethel. And there is an altar in this church. It's a very famous altar, right? Um, and um, he sees God standing beside. You might have a little footnote on that word beside. And then you go down to the bottom of the page and it might say on or upon. And that's because the preposition here doesn't necessarily mean God is standing where you're standing. If this is the prayer altar, the place that is being, the sacrifices are being given to God. God is standing actually like on top of it. Um, he actually appears in the place of worship where he's supposed to be. And it's not a good thing. God is standing there and I just want you to like, how big would your eyes get if right here on our communion table you saw God Almighty standing? It would be relatively terrifying. So he sees God in this church standing upon the altar and God is speaking and this is what he says. Strike the capitals until the thresholds shake. Shatter them on the heads of all the people. And those who are left of them, I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. Uh-oh. Right? This is the grizzly bear. This, this is the mauling, right? The Lord is standing upon the altar, and he's shouting out commands. Now, the people in the church, who's he talking to? God is issuing these commands, and they're not good commands, right? He's not saying, bring in the money. Hey, guys, check under your chairs. I've got a surprise. Each one of you will find a new set of keys to a brand new car. He's saying something very different. Strike the capitals. He's saying this to someone, and it's not the people in the church. All of creation is listening to this God. This God who's standing upon the altar in their church. And he's saying, strike the capitals until the thresholds shake. Then pick up those shaking thresholds and smash them over the heads of the people. Ooh, that, that's, I didn't come to church to hear that, Amos. Back it up a little bit. I don't want that kind of a relationship with God. And then it gets worse. 
those who are left, I know these broken thresholds around the city, with people's broken heads underneath them, but there's going to be some survivors. And those God is going to kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. There is no escaping the one true living God. If you're a note taker, write that down as point number one. There is no escaping the one true living God. Now, for those, that's either really good news or really, really bad news. Right? Either that is something that bolsters up your heart and goes, yes, there's no escape. There's no way that I am going to slip through God's fingers. Or that puts terror into your heart and you say, oh no, there's no way. There's no way that I can get away from him. In verse 2, if they dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them. Sheol is the place in Hebrew theology that's down in the center of the earth, under the ground, where all of the souls go and wait for the uh, judgment at the end of time. So when you die and you get buried in Hebrew theology, your soul goes down into Sheol. And uh, one of the more poetic things to talk about was digging into Sheol or arriving at Sheol. David says, like, if even I could get down into Sheol, still you would be able to find me. And God here is saying, if you actually made it to this place, my hand would reach in there and grab you. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I will search them out and take them. And if they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. And so things that are, that are even sort of inconceivable to us, right? And for us to actually, if you could, pack up all your stuff and get to the top of Everest and hang out there waiting for all of the judgment to pass, God is saying, nope, I will pluck you from there. And let's say you've gotten to a submarine. Every, the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket, and you've got yourself a little private submersible, and you're going to go to the very bottom of the ocean to ride it out, to ride out this judgment. God actually has servants there who will do his bidding. There's not one place in all of creation that we can go to escape God. And verse 4, and if they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. The people of Israel have really screwed up. And God's going to get them. I teach this to my kids. Not sure how it's going to turn out. We'll see. But I tell them at the dinner table, remember, when you do wrong, even if nobody sees, God does. And God is going to get you. I hope it helps them turn out to be good, <laughs> responsible adults. It's the truth, though. It is the truth that we can never escape God. And when he fixes his gaze upon you, either it is a wonderful, wonderful thing, or it is an absolutely terrible thing. Verse 5. The Lord God of hosts... He who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell in it mourn. And all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt. Now, Amos is, is here reminding the people of Israel. He, he's saying, hey God, God could take his finger and touch the earth, and it would be like, I don't know, uh, uh, Star Wars, the lightsaber, you know? It goes into a piece of metal, and all the metal starts shaking and turning red and dripping and that sort of stuff. That's like God's finger on the earth, and, and the whole earth turns into this molten glob and starts having wave patterns on it, you know, rises and sinks again. Remember, that's God's hand. He who builds his upper chambers in the heaven heavens and founds his vault upon the earth who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth the lord is his name and so he's he's saying god who lives in heaven who who's no matter how high you go you're not going to escape god he's already there right? and no matter how deep you go 
Even if you go into the sea, he has his vaults founded in the sea. God has a store down there. No matter where you go, God, God is already there. Furthermore, it's interesting here that Amos would then point to something that God does, calls for the waters of the sea to be poured out on the face of the earth. And he is talking about an incredible amount of grace that God gives to every being, planet, uh, every being, everything on the planet that is alive. There is this thing called rain upon which we depend. Without it, we all would die very quickly. Ask the people in California. Ask the people all over, once the rain fails, life will fail. And yet God is faithful to bring the rain. See, he's pointing not only to God's incredible amount of power and presence, he is pointing to God's incredible amount of grace for everyone, whether they know him or not, down to the tiniest little bug it depends upon God being God and doing God things in order to live. This is the God that we are in relationship with. Now listen to God speaking here in verse 7, because this is point number two, if you're a note taker, is that our theology describes God. It doesn't contain him. And so our theology, when it stops describing God accurately, is worthless. And the people had these bits of theology that they would turn to. They would have pastors and priests and stuff who would assure them, pat them on the back and go, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, God's not going to get you. You're one of the chosen people. No, 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 don't, don't you worry, don't you worry. You go to the temple, you bring your tithe, you're okay. They would tell them these sorts of things in order that the people might have their consciences alleviated. And God says in verse 7, are you not like the Cushites to me? Or if you have another version, it might say Ethiopians. Cushite means literally black people. And in uh, the Hebrew world and mind, they were the people who were sort of farthest away that were still in some way connected. You can read the Old Testament and find in Chronicles and other places people from Cush showing up. Um, and, so, and so they're really, really far away. They're like the farthest people away that you could think of who you still might know something about. Aren't you like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Wait, wait a minute. Because, because see, Israel is the center of the story, right? And the Cushites are way, way over here they get a minor notice at all. Like only, only the, the guys who really study a lot would even know who they are. But God is saying, no, 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 aren't they the center of my story too? And th this is just going to blow some theological circuitry in the mind. And so they have to sort of leave behind this, this, this one, this one piece of theology. We're the center. No, you're not. You're just like these people over here to me. Okay, but, but we're the people of the Exodus. We're the only people who have that kind of a salvation story. God came down to Egypt. He brought us up with his strong arm. And he planted us in this land. And here in the latter half of verse 7, God says, Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt? Whew, yes, that's us. You're right. I'm glad you remember, God. And the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kerr. The Philistines are the bad guys, right? God is saying here in Amos chapter 9 that the Philistines have an Exodus story too. That God brought them up out of a land and planted them in the promised land. The Syrians, the northern neighbors of Israel, those bad guys, God brought them up out of a land and planted them there too. And verse 8, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful nation, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. So here you have this introduction, and you just, need, you, you just need to hang on to this just for a second. If you're going to be a note taker, you can write this one down. It's that God is promising destruction upon the sinful. It's not Israel or not Israel. It's not USA or not USA. 
It's not Christian or non-Christian. It is the sinful are the ones who are going to be destroyed, except not utter destruction for the house of Jacob. Okay, so God's promising destruction on everybody, but there is going to be a group of people, a small group of people, who are not utterly destroyed. Does that intrigue you? Okay, really intrigues me. Here's why. I always thought, when you become a Christian, you're one of the people who don't get judged. When your name is written in the book of life, you don't have to worry about impending doom. Right? Like, like, like fire is going to fall upon the earth, and I've got this little umbrella over me, right? and that fire is not going to hit me. And that's what it means to be a Christian. And so, and so you really want to go through the sinner's prayer. You really want to pray this thing. And that way, you've got a divine umbrella, and judgment will never hit you. But this is not what God's saying. God is saying destruction's coming upon everybody. There will be a small group of people who are not utterly destroyed. Okay? Now, let's go into verse 9, and I, we're going to just have our minds blown. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say disaster shall not overtake or meet us. That's it. That's the key. That's the key right there. Amos is telling us something about God. God is speaking through Amos, and he is saying, I am bringing this shaking. Everybody's going to get shaken. And it's like he's got this big metal mesh sieve, and he's got it full of earth, and he's shaking it, and he's shaking it. And his people are the pebbles that won't fall through the mesh. But all of the dirt that's in there, too, is going to fall out. So we have to ask ourselves, right, what's the mesh? What's the mesh that keeps the people of God in the hands of God, even though he's shaking? But that same shaking action, the dirt falls through the mesh and goes to the earth for utter destruction, right? So everybody's getting shaken, but there will be some people who get shaken and still held on to, and other people who will be shaken and then destroyed. What is the key ingredient that makes you a pebble versus dirt? We should probably figure that out, right? There's a mesh there. What is that mesh? It tells us right here in the text in verse 10. He says, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say, disaster shall not overtake or meet us. Those people of God who reject his judgment, they say, it's not coming, he wouldn't dare. Those are the people who will be shaken and fall to utter destruction. Those people who say, no, 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 destruction's coming, judgment is coming, those are the people who will be shaken but will not fall through. Isn't that interesting? And I was really wrestling with that, just really wrestling with that. Okay, so I need to accept the fact that God is going to judge, that destruction is coming, and somehow that is going to save me? How? How does that save me? It's because... Having a relationship with God is not the same thing as having a healthy relationship with God. The people of Israel, the sinners, they had a relationship with God, but it was unhealthy. And so when the shaking came, when the judgment came, the relationship would naturally break. And because they had these expectations of what God was going to do for them, to them, and it did not include reality. Those people who have a relationship with God where they expect the hard things to come from him, the disaster to come from him. They know it's coming. Um, those are the people who, whose relationship will not be broken when it comes. And as I was wrestling this week, I was thinking about some of the really hard things that um, God has asked me to go through and walk through. And... Um, some of the people who I know, um, uh, particularly um, one of my friends from college, whose image of the Lord and what a relationship with God would look like, just 
just reality just didn't meet up with that. And when his parents got divorced and when just other hard things happened, he, it was convincing to him, so God can't be real. I mean, because because he, doesn't, he doesn't fit my expectation. And my expectation is that God is, is going to just give me things that I want. And that's not what God wants. He wants to be our Father. He wants to be our Lord. He wants to have a healthy relationship, but he has to be the one who is in charge. And he uses the hard things in life like he uses judgment to bring us closer to him, to allow us to let go of the garbage that we are trying to bring into the sanctuary. And so those people who say, yes, disaster is coming, disaster will meet us, God's judgment will be meted out on me. And yet, I will ever be his child. And yet, I will rely in grace on that day. And yet, you see, those people who are finding a way to get closer to God, to, to continue their relationship with God in the hard times, are the only people who will avoid destruction. Verse 11 is probably the best proof that I can give you. Amos, like the other prophets, has spent so much time. I feel like, I feel like, um, there's like this uh, um, velvet glove, right? And then these brass knuckles. And, and the prophet is sort of like, hey, 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 hey. Whap! Judgment's coming, right? But don't worry. Then God's, going to, then God's going to really be nice to you. He's really going to, okay, pow! More judgment, and then, and then God's going to be nice to you. And, and don't, don't you worry about it. There's, there's coming a day where you'll, you'll, get, you'll get through this and then, and then God's going to do this. And Amos here is doing something totally, radically different. Listen to the three words of verse 11. In that day. What day? In that day. The day of disaster. In the day of judgment. The day of judgment and this day in verse 11 are the same day. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen. It's as if, if you were listening to Amos all this time and going, I just want to get through all the judgment so I can get to the promised land, right? Let's get through the wilderness so that I can get to the promised land. Amos is saying, you don't get it. God doesn't work like that. God is the promised land. And if your experience in the wilderness does not include a relationship, a healthy relationship with God, then the promised land will never be the promised land. If you can't find in the hardship, in the judgment, the salvation and the promise, then something is seriously wrong with your theology. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruin and rebuild it as in the days of old that they might possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by name, declares the Lord who does this. This is actually the section that James quotes in um, uh, Acts I think chapter 15, where the Jerusalem council is trying to decide what is the Holy Spirit up to. And they took the day of Christ's death, that, that, to be this. And they said, he's including all nations. Let's include them. They belong in the church. Let's reach out to them. But how do we make sense of this? That the day of judgment is also the day of promise. That the day of shaking is also the day of repair. The day of tearing down is the day of raising up. The day of utter destruction is the day of rebuilding. What do we do with that? I, I think that we have to ask ourselves this question first. What do I believe about judgment? I think you have to ask yourself that question. What do I believe about judgment? Will I be judged or won't I be judged? And if you say, I will not be judged, 
you have screwed up theology. And it is going to cause your relationship with God to break. It will not survive because you will be judged. If you say disaster will not come upon me, I'm not going to go through anything hard because I believe in God. You most certainly not only are going to go through disaster, because everybody does, but your relationship with God will break because it's not a healthy relationship. If the blood of Jesus excuses you from hardship, you will not survive. But if the blood of Jesus is what gets you through it, if the blood of Jesus is what you claim on the day of judgment, if the blood of Jesus is what covers you through the fire, then you will be saved. And I think we don't have to get to the day of judgment to figure it out. I think we can figure it out right now. And I think that the hardship of life, what we're going through in our lives, the hard stuff, the stuff that we don't like, is what exposes our beliefs. It's what exposes the unhealthy relationship. If you go through a hard time and it makes you angry at God, it makes you mad, it makes you, it makes you uh, uh, want to start throwing spiritual jabs at God, it makes you want to withdraw from Him to play sort of emotional terrorism where you say, if you really love me, you'll change my circumstances. God, I'm hanging out over here until you change things. I'm not coming back to you. If you do that kind of garbage and that kind of nonsense, I am telling you, you need to make your relationship right with God. Who here remembers Lonnie? Lonnie, Lonnie, Lonnie. Came to our church for a while. Lonnie. And uh, Lonnie uh, was a friend of mine, and um, he had a really bad disease. And I met with him one time, and he said, hey, I might not see you for a while because um, they're going to call. The next time I collapse, they're going to send me to the hospital. The hospital's going to put me in hospice care because I got maybe three months. Just all depends on when the sickness is going to run its course. I know that I'm going to die. And I said, how can I support you? And he said, there is one thing. There is one thing. I want to meet Jesus with pure blood. And what he meant is no toxins in his blood, no drugs, no alcohol, no, none of that stuff. He said, I want to meet my Lord with that thing handled. And it's going to take a lot of his grace to get me through that. See, we all, we all, are going to meet Jesus. We all are going to have our lives radically changed. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to us right now, saying, I want you to change this thing. And it is the thing that is exposed by the hardships in your life that make you withdraw from God, that put you at odds with God. That thing, that expectation, that needs to be dealt with. There may be other events in your life. There may be many things, but I am calling you adopted church to make your heart ready for the coming of the Lord. We're going to do that this morning. Let me pray and then give some instruction. Heavenly Father, we desperately need you. We desperately need you. We desperately need you. We know that judgment is coming. We know that hardship is coming. We know that without your grace, we cannot stand. And Father, we also know that our minds can't contain who you are. We are a people who oftentimes go astray to the left or to the right, and we can't stay on the path, not without you, God, would you bring to our hearts and our minds the things that you need us to deal with, with your Holy Spirit. The things that you are putting in front of us and saying, I want to heal this. I want to change this. Would you help us to identify those things? Would you help us to lean into them and not away from them, knowing that you are good? 
knowing that you love us and that you have called us to become the people who bear your name. God, help us. It's in the, son, in the, in the name of your Son that we pray. Amen. Amen.